11 hours.
Yes. Yes. Buna lao. Thafi. Thafi ra thamo yaki thal. Thafi ra yaki thal tu seja. Ye reina vera para thama skuthna. Yes, my name is Kutrun, Kutrun. In Iceland, you pronounce it Kutrun, Kutrun. Did you hear? Kutrun. Yes. Yes. No, I don't. Yeah, I can see the phone.
Okay, so right now we're just uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna email the uh, Philadelphia group. Um, I'm sorry to, so what what um you should do while I'm fooling around here is to take a look at um uh, I thought we would start with a, a pretty straightforward poem by uh Craig Santos Perez. Um, that is, oh, that's not it. I'm sorry, this is the first time, you know, I did this once the other night and we went on for five hours, actually, Deviani. Wow. Um, but uh, so can you see on your screen a uh, Whole Foods in Hawaii? It's 1115. Can you see a uh, uh, Whole Foods in Hawaii? It's suddenly the screens become quite blurry. I don't know if it's my connection. I, well, we just had seven more uh, people. I'm going to try to do another connection through my computer so that I can see the short screen. I cannot see it through it. Through okay. It. Yeah, now I can see it. Okay. So, um, hello. So, um, Pamela, you're not going to let us see you? Um, I think not. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Um, and uh, Jason, I'm gonna. Is it okay if I turn on your mi microphone? I'm gonna do it right now. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Oh, there you are. Okay. Great. Yes. I'm here. I'm walking around the streets of oh, Philadelphia. Excellent. So, um, so you're I'm joining in as well. The phone. Um, yes. I can turn the camera on, but you might get dizzy with me turning the corners. Okay. Um, I think um, Gudrun from Iceland just dropped out for a second and is logging back in. Um, and what I, I also discovered that Craig Santos Perez and Brandy um, McDougal are married. Jason, who's, whose what? mic is causing static? Is that from your end or background noise from someone else's mic? That was um, probably my mic with the yeah, breeze blowing. So I'm gonna, who's outside. I'm gonna mute. Yeah, I'll mute and just stop in when I uh, when I'm around. When I hear okay. something fun. All right. And Michael, how are you? Good. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Um, Hi, be, uh, finally connected. Uh, yes. Some bumps uh, here, but uh, hopefully we'll get used to it. Yes. Um, so I'm waiting for uh, Gudrun uh, in Iceland just logged out and said she was going to log right back in. So as soon as she's here, we can um, fully begin. But um while we're waiting for her 
why don't we um, start off and read. Um, I thought what we would do is read uh, two Craig Santos Perez poems and then look at um, some of the imagery on the uh, Dan Talawa Papa uh, McMullen site. Here, here's Gudrun. Okay. Okay. So so what um can everybody see uh the poem on the screen? Yes. 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 Great. Um now what I wanted to do is give you so so Craig Santos Perez um, is from Guam and so I thought I would play just a little bit of uh, someone speaking in Chamorro the the native language of Guam so we can hear the other language that's in his um, mind. Um, so I'm gonna switch over to my phone. And so you should be able in a moment, okay. So here we can just uh, listen to a little girl and a, a woman speaking in uh, the Chamorro language, just for a moment. Um, I'm, and so um, Pam, Gudrun, and Michael, on our discussion, on uh, Thursday night, we talked a lot about the existence in Hawaii of three separate languages, that there is the indigenous Hawaiian language, there is Hawaiian pidgin, which is a Creole language that emerged um, among the uh, migrants to Hawaii who went there to work on the plantations. And there's uh, formal English. Um, so, uh, I, so I believe that, so, Brand, so Brandy um, McMullen, is a, a native Hawaiian speaker, whereas, uh, where is that? Uh, whereas uh, Lisa, who wrote Sister Tongue, is a pigeon speaker. So they're both uh, have have different language influences on their poetries. Um, and just to, so, so let me play this so you can get a sense of how this sounds. Special thanks to the Moral Academy. Call them at 472-5858 for translation services, after school, summer, adult, and corporate Chamorro language classes. Princess 
on your shirt. Okay. Miss Crystal Rock, these are Daniel Heights and Ralph. Daniel Ralph? Yeah. And then, uh, we must have a So the subtitles are a little bit uh, crazy. <laughs> yep, you think? <laughs> if you can see them because it's trying to translate it as if it's English. Oh, that I see. Uh, yeah. Who taught me math? Who taught me science? Who taught me social studies? Who taught me health? Zan taught me soccer. Oh, you can check. Okay. You can. Jamu is Kolam. Okay. Okay. Who Jamu Mura? Okay. Siguru how? Okay. Okay, so I just wanted you to have a sampling of of that language. I wanted to give you also um a sampling of um uh Is that the same pigeon that was in the sister poem? Uh, hold on one sec. That, um, what we were just listening to is the language, the native language of Guam. So on the, the you know, 2000, 1000s of miles away. Okay, because um, uh, it's sounded very different. Yes, and and what I want to give you a sense of is how different all these languages are that are operating in this. Um, so this is someone um, who's going to be speaking native Hawaiian. Large dark backed ones. <laughs> That's probably not the Here we go. Can you hear me? Yeah? Ke hele nei hei wa kalu wa makahiki o ko shan me mai ko kama aina ke kahi ke kahi. Ama hope o ko ho kani ana no ke kahi mau makahiki ke koma nei ka ao ao ho opuka i ke yamanava. We played together with Fiji and. So the woman who is speaking in the background is speaking native Hawaiian, which is uh, an oral language that emerged over the course of time by the original inhabitants of the Hawaiian Islands. So I think the people she's interviewing are going to speak in English, but listen to her uh, speaking in Hawaiian. Roby and a whole bunch of people. Pa'ahana mau no ya hale o kileo o studio ala moana me ke kipa ana mai o na anu mea puolo like ole e like ho i me kahi la la o ke kalapu hi meni o na leo o lehua kalima no ho i. Working with lehua is definitely different from working with na leo just because. So one one thing I wanted you to do, there's a a very different there's almost uh, to native Hawaiian a very mellifluous um sound um there are very few um the hawaiian alphabet array a range array of sounds is very limited 
and so it's mostly uh, uh, liquid consonants like L, M, N, and um, and so forth. And so it, if you hear it spoken, it is almost like a, a kind of, I mean, it, it's, it's, it, it flows li like liquid uh, through the syllables, um, which, is which is totally different from um, Hawaiian pigeon. And, and Michael, I'm gonna do the best I can to um, see if their arguments sound okay. No. Okay. Well, you know what? Big, you go on boat, all right? John, you go on boat. Go on. Time you go to. It's 11.30. You guys go this side. The same like the other day, I'm on. About three times, but when you're coming down sprint sometimes, then lengthen out. Portuguese, Japanese, okay, this is Korean. If all the immigrants that went come from all over the place, Japan, Philippines, China, Portugal, when come together, that's the language. Can people ask, what's Pidgin? Pidgin one language, we're talking Hawaii. More than half the people here, different from Hawaiian. Maybe a little bit like English, but get all kinds of stuff from other kind of languages mixed in. Like from Hawaiian, Cantonese, Portuguese, Japanese, Korean, Filipino. You know, other people would work the plantations. At the time when they started the plantations in Hawaii, the power on the plantations were primarily English speakers. The immigrant groups do not know each other's language. They're very, they're different languages. So in order to communicate with each other, they are using English or whatever English they can hear. So let's say a Japanese immigrant and a Portuguese immigrant trying to speak English to each other, but throwing in features from their own first languages as well. That's how pigeons start. One of the interesting features about pigeon, it has to get vocabulary from somewhere. So one of the things it does is it borrows a lot of the vocabulary from the language, from the languages around it. I can sort of hear my grandmother saying stuff. It's something like, you daiki banana, you wiki wiki kao kao mai tai. Um, the meaning of that, you daiki banana, if you want this banana, you wiki wiki kao kao. You quickly eat it, mai tai, it'll be okay. Does that make sense? So um, the the pigeon language is a combination of many languages. It's a Creole, which is the same thing that we find in Jamaica. Basically, all of the um, colonial powers who brought workers from our different countries around the globe to a particular location to work together through most of the day, they um, had to know they had the, the presence of the, their master's English but in the fields, they're basically working out the the simplest way of um, 
they're kind of blending together their own languages. So a pidgin is um, officially known as a Creole language. And all of these Creoles emerged during um, the major colonial period. So there's there are Dutch pigeons, uh, Spen uh, French pigeons. Um, it depends on where the origin, the convergence of the workers were coming from. Um, in addition to the uh, colonial power language. So at the same time you have, an, on Hawaii, you have an already existing language, which is also getting um, pulled into the pidgin as well. But there's a, a very strong um, divide in Hawaii along the language lines, your kind of ethnic community identity is based in whether you are a, a formal English speaker, a pidgin speaker, or a native Hawaiian speaker. The situation on Guam is entirely different because uh, Guam was not Guam was uh, settled by missionaries, but um, the original language was pretty much allowed to go on until uh, the until Guam became a militarily crucial base. Um, so in Guam once it became an, an unincorporated territory of the United States, the, the children were required to go to public schools, which were strictly conducted in English. Um, but at home and amongst themselves, they continued to speak in their, um, the, the Guam, native language. Does that make sense? And so, so each kind of island throughout the Pacific is going to have its own distinct uh, language situation and complexity due to um, whether it was economically valuable um, uh, in the early colonial period or whether it didn't become valuable until say uh, the Spanish American and uh, World War One and world especially World War II um, so, this is by way of saying that Craig Santos Perez is very um, politically oriented toward reclaiming the original Guam language, even though he writes to a, in, in English. But I mean, depending on which poem we're reading, um, we'll read this one in English, but then we'll read one in which he uses uh, a large sampling from the native Guam language as well. And um, let's see, so let's, let me switch you back to um, the screen. Um, so he, 
he so this is occurring in Hawaii where he also spends a lot a lot of time and where he met his wife at the University of Hawaii um but let's uh would would someone like to uh Michael why why don't you uh read read this poem to us the whole thing yeah it'll go <laughs> it'll go pretty fast because there aren't a lot of uh unfamiliar words and right. it also um i picked it because it is almost a a, a parody of a poem that we know well from mod poet right okay uh a whole foods in hawaii i dreamed of you tonight wayne kamuali -e, westlake as i walked down on the sidewalk under plumeria trees with a vague headache looking at the mahialani moon in my need for grinds and hungry for modernity i stumbled into a gent the gentrified lights of whole foods dreaming of your manifestos what pineapples and what papayas bus loads of tourists shopping at night bulk aisles full of hippies millennials in the kale settlers in the kona coffee and you richard hamasaki what were you doing kissing the ripe mangoes? I saw you, Wayne Kaumualii, Westlake, broomless, ghostly janitor, sampling the poke in the seafood section and eyeing the smoked fish. I heard you ask questions of each. Who butchered the mahi-mahi? What price opa belly? Are you my au makua? I wandered in and out of the canned goods aisle following you and followed in my imagination by Sir Spamalot. In our bourgeois family fancy, we strolled through the cooked food section, tasting hand churned cheese, possessing every imported delicacy and whispering to the cashier, go fuck yourself. Where are we going? Sorry, I'm trying not to laugh as I, <laughs> as I read this. Where are we going, Wayne Kuma Ali Westlake? The doors of perception close in an hour. Which way does your Pakalolo point tonight? I touch your book and dream of our Huaka'i in Whole Foods and feel Dada. Will we sail all night through Honolulu streets? The coconut trees no have nuts, tarps up for the homeless, we'll both be lonely. Will we cruise witnessing the ruined empire of America, past pink mopeds and driveways, home to our overpriced apartments? Ah, dear uncle, Buddha head, ghostly poetry teacher, what Hawaii did you have when the bus quit turning its wheels and you arrived in Waikiki and stood watching the canoes disappear on the murky waters of the Alawai. That's it. Yep. All right. Wow. So, <laughs> so let's turn our microphones back on. Um, and uh, what what's your what what are some of your initial responses to this and what are some of your questions well it's it's much more of i mean it's a parody of of the poem you know in the sense uh, that ginsburg was was writing um uh, I mean, he wasn't really writing a, a parody. So th this has, you know, it just it's more humor than his. It, it's it's like, uh, I don't know, uh, making fun of it, you know, rather than being the Hawaiian version of it. He, he's just having fun with the Ginsburg, you know, and instead of throwing, 
uh, what is it, egg, egg salad at, at the professors. He's saying, go fuck yourself or something. Right. You know, just, just playing around, having, a, having fun. And it is a fun poem. Yeah, what struck me um, when I read this, I was expecting something different when you first spoke about it, because um, I think our first meeting um, with the Philly group um, more than a year ago, we looked at Yolanda Wishers. Um, I can't pronounce it, but it's the I'm Hotep's Kundalini, um, mm -hmm. where she starts off with I, what dreams I have of you tonight, and it's for Du Bois. And so I thought this was gonna be similar to that and have its own real sense of, I don't know, like pondering the culture and what it means to be from Guam and living in Hawaii. But instead it's like Michael said, it's just very much a parody line for line. It didn't, for me, take off on its own in the same way that Yolanda Wisher's parody did, not parody, but Yolanda Wisher taking off in that form and with that first line did. Okay, well, let's to ask a question to maybe um, deepen it a bit. What's, um, there are a few- It's 1145. Uh, um, there is a particular poet that's being named here, Wayne Kamalali Westlake, who was um, only posthumously published and was uh, an impoverished but dedicated um, poet um, in Hawaii. Uh, pretty much in the the seventies, and he's now kind of being rediscovered. Um, his poems are actually highly influenced by Japanese poetry, due in part to the huge Japanese. Uh, immigrant population in Hawaii. Um, and so the Westlake poems read kind of like haiku or like Sid Corman poems. Um, they're as far away from what a Whitman poem might be like in terms of its vast embrace of the everything of America. They're very minimal. Um, and we also have um, the movement in the peace among languages, right? This isn't strictly written in, in English. And like I said, um, I think what we might want to do is think in a way about Ginsburg seeing Whitman in a supermarket and the kind of newness of, of what a supermarket was say in California um, and, and what that kind of uh, profusion of commerce um, evoked for, for Ginsburg as almost the kind of dark manifestation of the Whitmanian um, everythingness you know, every, every, everything's for sale at the supermarket. But um, in here, we have um, uh, 
a, a place, Hawaii, where people were before the arrival of the plantation owner, the, the Dole primarily uh, pineapple plantation owners, where what was food, food was abundant everywhere. Um, you didn't need to have um, uh, you know, really like strict agriculture in Hawaii to um, live for centuries and centuries on fish and, and fruit and the abundance of the landscape. So in a way that, um, so, I, so I guess I want to think about the, I mean, what is the, the Whole Foods is full of busloads of tourists shopping at night um, who are uh, getting the Kona coffee and the ripe mangoes, uh, things that are grown in Hawaii. I mean, the coffee plantations are another economic um, colonialist uh, instance. So in a way, the, the contrast between the inside and the outside, I think is very, this is not a spiritual poem. I, this is a poem about the 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 kind of uh, paradox of the capitalist endeavor of a Whole Foods grocery store in a place with such abundance as Hawaii. So um, you saying uh, or implying here that though we didn't get it on our first reading that this poem may have the same kind of depth that the Ginsburg poem has? Oh, yes. I mean, and Wayne Kamali Westlake died penniless and um, was never recognized for his writing. Um, although he was very involved in writing communities in Hawaii, he was never, he never achieved any level of success during his lifetime. Um, what, if I can um, interject for a moment. Yeah. What is the purpose of the Richard Hamasaki in that stanza where he's talking about busloads of tourist shopping at night? Um, Richard Hamasaki was Wayne Kamali Westlake's best friend. Oh, is now okay. his literary executor. So there is a book of Wayne Kamali uh, Westlake poetry um, that was assembled and published by Richard Hamasaki. So I could, um, if we look, if we just look at, uh, and Richard, let's see if I can do the, manage this. Um, so so I, I looked him up. So are we talking about Kamasaki's um, a son or are we talking about 
No, no, they were it, friends. Uh, uh, Wayne Kamali Westlake died very young, like in his late 30s or early mid 30s. So I'm, I'm looking at an obituary for Richard Hamasaki. So maybe it's the wrong person who is a, a war hero. No, that's not the right. Person. Not the right guy. Okay. Um, let me, uh, hold on. There's an important uh, web page that I'll try to um, get us to. Um, this should be enough to. Okay, so, whoops. Um, so, this website that I'm looking at right now, um, so uh, we can just read this, this little portion right here. Um, Richard Hamasaki, poem, poet and spoken word artist, author of From the Spider Bone Diaries, Poems and Songs, literary critic, editor, and publisher of four CDs of amplified poetry has a new project, um, which is uh, this documentary film, which I'll show you a clip from. Hamasaki is a friend to all poets of Hawaii, nay, and beyond, including Hawaiian poet, journalist, and activist Wayne Kamali Westlake, who was killed in 1984 by a drunk driver. Hamasaki has maintained a co creative collaboration with this soul brother through processes like projects like the one he's working on now, down on the sidewalk on Waikiki. It's a new CD of Westlake's poems and songs performed by other great poets, such as Emma, uh, Emma Kalani Kalehe, uh, Sia Figiel, Teresia Tiawa, and more. Um, so, so Hamasaki, um, but if we look, so the website is called Noho Hewa, The Wrongful Occupation of Hawaii, a documentary film. And um, he has, let's see if I can find it. Okay, so there's a, a trailer for this documentary film that uh, Hamasaki is working on, which is just two minutes. So can you see this? I can make it big. 1993, when the occupation began in Hawaii, it wasn't a rebellion of Hawaiian citizens. It was occupation of the U.S. military forces that came in 1893, which continue to occupy land to this day. That's the history. Lands are being scooped up by the military. Good. As an expansion of their military. And we don't want that anymore. Tourism, militarism, those are material forces that have changed the way people who are native endure or don't endure. And we want to, I'm going to keep playing it, but um, one thing to think about is the the poem that we read by uh, Brandy uh, Talapapa, no, no, um, by Brandy uh, McDougal on Thursday is 
a poem in which the military there there are references to um, World War II and the and Pearl Harbor um, that gorgeously mutate into images of palm trees. Um, so, but if we think about, I mean, Hawaii's economy is the military and uh, massive corporate agriculture. So in this poem, we're seeing the uh, the massive corporate. It's almost to think that the uh, the the produce at a Whole Foods in Hawaii would have been grown in Hawaii, shipped back to the mainland in California, and then sent back to the Whole Foods in Hawaii. Um, All my life, he wanted me to bear them. I'm not doing it no more. Who oh, I am and who oh, oh, my ancestors are. What is the truth? Oh, what? What is the truth? Oh, what? It's twelve hours. You is a land grab in the disguise of granting Hawaiians the rights of American Indians. Unity will not be given to us. Unity will be taken by us. When we saw Hawaii, yeah, they took that too. We saw the hula and they called it bigger. This thing, what they did in things, question, they were ripping up the Pacific. And another thing that made me quite scary would they even give a damn if Hawaii wasn't so important to the world. So, um. Get, get back to. Okay, so um, so I mean, basically, the the one of the pivotal another pivotal iron irony of the poem is to place Wayne Kamali Westlake, who was hit and killed by a drunk driver in his 30s who died in poverty and never published a book um, as the, the stand-in for Whit, uh, the figure of Whitman in the eyes of um, Ginsburg. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, and uh, so, so in a, uh, in our bourgeois fancy, we strolled through the cooked foods section, tasting hand churned, churned cheese, possessing every imported delicacy and whispering to the cashier, go fuck yourself. Um, where are we going, William Kamali Westlake? The doors of perception close in an hour. Which way does your Pakalolo point tonight? And so, that's marijuana, the Pakalolo? Is that, is that true? Well, I, I just looked it up on Google, and, and that's what uh, came up. Okay. Well, let, let's, let's, um, there's a, a great um, site that is a Hawaiian dictionary. 
because I know you were saying the other day that these uh, these words have a page. One word will have a page of meanings. Yeah, that's what I'm I'm going to right now. So um, let's just pick. Uh, so this is the an excellent research resource. Um, it's called wehewehe.org and it's a thorough Hawaiian dictionary. So um, why don't we pick a, a diff, we can try that word and see what comes up. Um, but there are a number of other words as well that do the work of, because we have to think about who is the readership of this poem. I mean, in a way, it seems like a parody of a Ginsburg poem. So it's placing itself in the tradition of kind of canonical US English language poetry. But it makes these moves where it uses non-English words so that the English reader gets kind of pushed out a little bit. Um, it's, I, I take the use of like Pakalolo and Huakai as uh, much more elegant ways of saying to the reader, go fuck yourself. Mm. Um, and to think that um, the, the, the descendants of the plantation workers are incredibly impoverished, as we saw from that homeless camp on the beach. And um, so something like a Whole Foods would not be a place available to them. It's a place for the mainland tourists um, who, but, uh, so let, let's, I'll look at uh, Pakalolo, which I think, let's, let's see what, what, we, what it says. Okay, so here we got, and, and so this we're gonna, I'm gonna say is a pigeon word, okay? Because we have paka, like, like you pack. Um, a joint and then lolo. So my impulse then would be to say, well, what, what does the word low mean? So there are three different uh, variants of that word. But if we look at the first, um, uh, I think part of it is, uh, but, is, but, is but, just the word grass itself, and then a you know a, a special kind of of grass. But look at. Uh, also, what is here? Um, I mean, what do you what do you call the thing that you like clip the end of a marijuana joint with? Oh, uh, <laughs> too much to uh, uh, remember. Um, I think it has like an insect name. Oh, like a a pincer or a forceps or a uh, what's the medical uh, um, yeah, roach, wasn't that a roach, roach clip? clip? Yeah, roach that's clip. it. <laughs> it's a roach clip. All right. So, all right. So for Pakalolo, oh, we insect. have low and a black, the first definition of low 
just watch the sequence of what this word simultaneously is connoting. A black insect earwig, the front half of the skull, Lord from English, and then a line of Oahu chiefs. So we go from Pakalolo um, from a word kind of initially coming from the low, the, the roach clip to also meaning a line of uh, Oahu chiefs. So there is a sense of uh, dignity and um, history that the word contains that is not contained in the word roach clip. See what I mean? So, um, and these words, when you say low, I mean, you have like an English word with multiple definitions. You have the cascade of connotations that are present. Um, but let's just look up another one. I don't know what uh, our dream of Huakai, um, is. That's, uh, yeah, a complicated uh, word for trip, uh, a, a special kind of uh, a trip. Okay, and so, and again, I mean, Eng the English word trip is, is a good, example of a word like low that contains multiple meanings within itself yeah it sounded like the, the it's travel and movement was was part of it and this you know one of the uh the sentences talked about the uh, the white foam of the sea, you know, as if you're in a canoe going someplace. Where, where are you looking? Uh, I don't know. I just typed it. I just typed it into Google and uh, kind of read a bunch of stuff. Okay. I don't. I don't know where it came from. So I here. Let me. Let's try it because uh, the spelling isn't consistent. Okay. Did you mean this word? Yeah, I just got a bunch of stuff like that and, and read through it to get a feel for it. All right, let, let me go back and try that spelling. Okay, so here we go. Yeah, that was one of the things I uh, I saw. Right. Um, but what what might be um, used? So I think um, Pamela that if we read. Uh, if so, um, so Deviani and and um, I mean, really, just uh, Jason experienced this other poem the other night, um, which is a poem that I I think will. Um, the Brandy Nailani, Nailani uh, McDougall's poem. So, um, 
Pam, you wouldn't re you wouldn't read this one, would you? Or do you want to hear someone else read it? Why, Jason? Why don't you read it? Um, did you? I'm sorry. Did you ask me to read it? Yeah. Would you? Um. So I haven't seen it before, but let me take a look at it quickly well, and yeah. sure. Why not? Yeah. Okay. I'm so tired of pretending each gesture is meaningless that the clattering of new leaves and the guttural call of birds overhead say nothing. There are reasons why the lichen and moss cacao, the news bark, why this tree was worn, an ahu of wa and lay. I can't see what the it's letter a, is there. I think it's la. La, okay. Since birth, scars were carved into its trunk to record the mo o lay lo of its being by the passage of insects becoming one to move the earth speck by speck. Try to tell them to let go. Oh, try to tell them to let go of the new rings marking each passing year to abandon their only home and move on. I can't pretend there is no memory held in the dried coconut hat, the star ornament the mid-ribs bent and dangling away from their roots, no thought behind the Kawaluweli that continues to hold us steady. There was a time before- Sorry. What? Uh, that was my computer talking to me. Okay. There was a time before they were bent under their need to make an honest living when each frond was bound by its life to another like a long erect fin skimming the surface of a sea of grass and sand. Eventually, it knew it would rise higher, its flower would emerge gold, then darken in the sun, that its fruit would fall only to ripen before its brown fawns bent naturally under the weight of such memory, back toward the trunk to drop to the sand, back to its beginnings again. Let this be enough to feed us to remember Kawelua, I loco, that our own bodies are buoyant when they bend and fall, that the ocean shall carry us and weave us back into the sand's fabric, that the mo opunu taste our sweet. Okay. So I, I botched several of those words for sure, but. I, I, I think that we have to not worry about botching other people's words um because as as native english speakers <coughs> um we are so used to there being a proper mode of speaking and uh on thursday night um tan from Siberia was on and uh, he was talking about where the region in Siberia where he lives, there are lots of different uh, ethnic groups that all speak different languages um, and that they're always messing up. You know, like any conversation is always a kind of humorous, uh, way of of a, a humorous kind of collision of partially known languages do you know what i mean so i think that the kind of uh anxiety or um kind of almost feeling of doing something wrong by mis not knowing how to pronounce a word is is a really important conceptual issue and it's part of our um we we speak in the language of global empire right and we're taught in school, there's nothing to challenge us in school or at home unless we grew up with immigrants. And you talked about 
um, kind of listening to the Jewish words or the Hebrew words in synagogue. Um, the most of the world um, is a big um, mess of languages. And the thought that anyone would become fluent in all of them and be able to speak them all perfectly is a notion that could only come from a speaker of global English. Does that make it, sense? Yes, but um, so pronunciation in the English speaking world is considered um, a big thing. Um, in fact, we have a um, our test of what we call estimated IQ, not a full IQ test, but just like if you can't, if you can't give one, um, you give them this word pronunciation list. It's 50 words and you ask people to pronounce them, not what the words mean, but just to pronounce them and you get an estimate of their actual, you know, English IQ score. And um, so for me, when I read something and I can't pronounce it, I feel like I haven't done my homework and that I'm doing a disservice to the poet in not getting the sounds of their poem correct because it's not just the words, it has to be the sound as well. Right, but what, what I'm saying is, is the poet is deliberately giving you words that you're going to have trouble pronouncing. Yes. That, that's a formal decision, I mean, that's a, like a line break. It's a formal decision to insert a word that um, someone who doesn't speak the language is gonna stumble over. And, and there's and also the oral aspect of it if, if you're just hearing it and there's no written word to pronounce, the only thing would be to, to try and imitate and, and make the sound that you heard, which is totally different. So us reading, you know, seeing the spelling and, and reading it is, is kind of our problem also. Right, yeah, and, and I'd really, um, uh, the Lisa, uh, Kine, uh, the Lisa Kine book, Sister Tongue, is about the humiliation that, that basically in Hawaii, all of the wealthy people from the military and the plantation owners would send their children to expensive private schools where they were taught proper English um, because they didn't want their, their children's English to be corrupted by the pigeon that the, um, the local students would have been speaking in the hallways of the, of the schools outside of class. Please charge me. So, um, so in a way, what, what you just said about that, um, that notion that proper pronunciation is a sign of intelligence is basically, Battery charging. is basically what her book, Sister Tongue, is about. And it's about, um, the the assumption of stupidity of the people who spoke pidgin rather than you know who grew up in households speaking pidgin rather than speaking proper english that's actually a, a common issue that we have even here in our schools that you will find at times a child who emigrated to the United States will be put into a special ed classroom, not based on 
their abilities, but because they haven't mastered the language yet and nobody knows what to do with them, and it's an assumption that they're not able to learn just because they have not yet mastered the language. Right, and to, to um, test the IQ of one of those students through a list of words to pronounce is insane. Well, no, they, it, it's not a test that you give to children. It's, um, it's a test that you give to adults based on the idea that once you know a word, you know it forever. It's not going to be affected by age-related decline. And so we give it to older adults, not okay. to children. Well, I mean, in the documentary clip, the guy was talking, one of the clips, the guy was talking about his gra remembering his grandmother's speech in um, that that I guess what 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 I'm I'm I want to dwell on for a moment because I think it's it's really in crucial to the to a close reading of the poem is the discomfort we have around language that is um, not easily invisible. I mean, in a way, the point, my, my hypothesis of the, the entire class is that English for, for most of, for most US monolingual speakers is invisible. But for most of the rest of the population of the earth, English is not invisible. It, it has its own connotations and has its own, um, to, to, to not write this poem entirely in um, Hawaiian is, is a formal decision that we can um, interpret and, and analyze and have an emotional response to. Like what, what, what does it mean to write a poem that is going to be read one way by a non-native speaker of Hawaiian who can read this in English? Um, also knowing, because we also know that there is um, a reader that does know that language that's going to have a different experience of the poem than we will on our first reading of it. So that's like, a, I, I would say that that is as, that the, the use of English is like the use I mean, a, a perfect figure for thinking about this is Claude McKay. When Claude McKay for the first 20 years wrote in Jamaican Patois and then left and went to the big city and wrote in proper English. Um, but what is the and and so in a way like someone who doesn't speak english perfectly risks internalizing a feeling of of almost shame mm -hmm. just the feeling that you had 
when you couldn't read the, those words in a sense. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I agree. And I, I think, I mean, I haven't been following your course closely because I've been overwhelmed with work, yeah. but in some of the poems that I've looked at, I think this inserting native words into the English is very, very common. Um, I think we saw that with Craig Santos Perez and with some others that you read, that it's not at all. Um, who else was I thinking of? I think Jeffrey Yang, mm -hmm. that we had spoken yeah. about in the meeting. Yeah, that it's, it's not uncommon to see that. Um, and so if, if I'm interpreting you right, it's that the poet is intentionally doing this not to necessarily speak to the people who know those words, but to make the people who don't understand what it like, what it feels like to be other. Yeah, I, that's a beautiful way of stating it, I think. Um, and so for, for this poem, I, I went and made a glossary of all of the Hawaiian words. And um, they, uh, if if you read some of these, so, it's twelve thirty. So these are taken from page several page long definitions, and I I condensed them down to like three lines. But um, so part of the question is, is like what, what's going on in this poem even? Like what is this a poem of, which, what's the topic of the poem? And um, one of the kind of amazing moments for me in, and you know, reading through the material is learning that um, this uh, the the word new new or new leaves new is um, the word for a coconut tree, but it's a word that we as English speakers can he at least hear as the word new, N-E-W. Um, but the entire um, poem is using the Hawaiian words to unbalance I mean, in a way, this is a poem about the life cycle of a palm of a of a coconut tree that grows on the beach. Um, that uh, has lines ingrained all around it through the patterns of the the travels of tiny insects over decades. Um, this so, doesn't seem as uh, confrontational as the other. I mean, this it no, seems like she's using those words because they uh, they better explain what she's trying to say. Yeah, and and what what the words also do is. Um, like when you read the definitions, it's it's really clear that the the concepts of mind, nature, and culture are not separate concepts. The words move. The words definitions move across 
all of these different things that we would divide. So I think that in a way, this is an angry poem because it's saying, try, try to tell them um, to let go of the new rings marking each passing year to abandon their only home and move on. And, and to me that what's being addressed is capitalist American monoculture that, uh, or even just uh, the European philosophical tradition that sees meaninglessness in the sounds and movements of nature. Like I'm tired of pretending each gesture is meaningless, that the clattering of the new leaves and the guttural call of the birds over her, overhead say nothing. She's saying that they are also speaking and and she's literally saying that if if one kind of keeps working at the poem and uh so there's a so try try to tell them to let go of the new rings and what's what's an interesting paragraph is that we read the word new as a new ring but each new ring marks a passing year so the rings are a sign of of age but it's saying to a bit so so here like the only really political thing we get is to ban abandon their only home and move on which would be the temptation of the a hawaiian youth to like when i was uh, doing some initial research and looking up all these maps of the Pacific, I was, I wanted to present a bunch of beautiful nature pictures, but then I realized, you know, these islands are also urbanized. So you have, um, you know, I mean, try to tell them to, to let go to abandon their home and move on is to kind of say, to leave your hometown and uh, go to the big city, which, you know, is to go to Honolulu, which does not resemble the rest of the island. It's a gigantic, um, non-natural, technological thing where nature and and culture have been clearly split like if you look at these kind of aerial shots of Honolulu it's astonishing to see how massive it is and how it goes up the sides of the mountains and the millions of skyscrapers so, um, so, but then she says, I can't pretend there's no memory held in the dried coconut hat, the star ornament, the midribs bent and dangling away from their roots. So what really shocked me in reading this poem is her, is, is at this point in the poem, she switches from Hawaiian to English and goes from the new leaves to a dried coconut hat. And so what is, so, so to me, I could, I would write a dissertation on the choice to, to switch from the Hawaiian and to use the English word for the same thing. And the star ornament, I mean, in a way makes me think of, if you think of a star ornament and you think of uh, Hawaii, um, 
I mean, what what's in the 20th century's history of Hawaii, what is the most significant event? Well, for them or for us? <laughs> for, for in, in, in world history. Yeah, so the, the, you know, the war, Pearl Harbor started World War II for us. Exactly. And and so I see like in the dried coconut hat, like a, a tourist wearing like a, a a Hawaiian hat. And in the star ornament, I see like a medal of valor, a military medal. But in saying those things, it goes on and says the mid ribs bent and dangling away. If we stop it away, we can think of like mid ribs. We can think of the way a ship is constructed with ribs that hold it together. Um, and like a boat exploding as the, the mid ribs bent and dangling away. But then it switches right back and turns these western these potentially western images they're folded back into the uh or, organic life of the tree because we could say if you look at a, up at a palm tree that it looks like there's a you know the way the leaves uh jut out in different in a star formation um we could say that that a coconut tree has a coconut hat um and then so and then it says no thought be behind the kawela wela that continues to hold us steady and this word is the one that that blew blew me away completely um let's see if it comes up um and so the so the at that moment what what Kuela Willa if we read the um, definition, just the first definition, so this is definition number one, meaning that it means this one, this is one specific meaning. Uh, so if we look at the poem and say, uh, the mid ribs bent and dangling away from their roots, no thought behind the Coelhoela that continues to hold us steady. There was a time before they were bent. But Coelhoela means ropes, especially those attached to Iaku. Outrig an outrigger is one of the uh, Haw traditional Hawaiian canoes with many rowers that have the kind of outreaching booms that keep it afloat or um, their ropes to assist in riding a capsized canoe lines attached to a fishnet the person or canoe at the head of a line being pulled so it's not just the rope this word also means a rope that's being used to to turn something that has uh, that is at risk of sinking back over and rescuing it but that it also means the thing at the end of the rope that's being rescued and then it says part of the meaning of it as well is to recall something almost forgotten dim memory um 
so there's a, uh, and then there's a, a saying, a Hawaiian saying, that's saying, um, uh, when an almost forgotten thought is recalled, these ropes are like the ropes to memories that are in danger of, of sinking away or disappearing. And so um, if, if we look at the poem again, I can't pretend there is, so remember, Kawela Wela means both to rescue a sinking boat and the thread that attaches to a fading memory. Um, I can't pretend there is no memory held in the dried coconut hat, the star ornament, the midribs bent and dangling away from their roots. No thought behind the koela wela that continues to hold us steady. So to hold us steady is both literally to hold the boat steady, but also to hold the culture steady in place through memory because there was a it's time. It's 12.45 because there was a time before they were bent and then the they under their need to make an honest living. So then the, the they um, is, what's amazing is the use of pronouns in this poem and how they are so super slippery <laughs> because uh, what does this they refer to? The they could refer to, um, they were bent under the need to make an honest living and abandon their Hawaiian roots. Um, or um, it can literally mean um, they were bent when each frond was bound by its life to another. So there's this, the they is referring to both the kind of uh, palm fronds all attached together at the top of the tree um, that, that fall eventually to the ground. Um, and um, so, And then, so so the, the 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 pronouns are refusing to differentiate between human and nature. Every pronoun could possibly be referring to a natural object or to a human population, or to a person, or a group of people. Um, so eventually it knew it would rise higher. So what is the it? It is, um, the tree, but it is also the kind of those threads of, of memory of what life was like before colonialism um, allow the culture to, to know it would rise higher, its flower would emerge gold, then darken in the sun, that its fruit would fall only to ripen before its brown fronds bent naturally under the weight of such memory. Back toward the trunk to drop to the sand back to its beginnings again. So what? it's the history of a tree and the history of the, the people and their uh, 
uh, being uh, invaded by uh, by our culture. Right, but what the cook what the coconut tree has are coconuts that are seeds that will, uh, I mean, coconuts are throughout the tropics because coconuts float. They're not only filled with liquid themselves, but they're seeds that can float over great distances and grow anew. Um, so let this be enough to feed us, to remember. Co so again, this kawea whale echoes the sound of the uh, the kawela wela above. It's almost a uh, homonym, um, but it means something else. Um, it means, ka means the cook, so, so this phrase here, ka, let us remember, kawela, kawela wa iloko, that our own bodies are buoyant when they bend and fall, that the ocean shall carry us and weave us back into the sand's fabric that the mo puna taste are sweet. And the, well, I'll just work backwards. The mo puna puna means grandchild, grandniece, or nephew, relatives two generations later, whether blood or adopted, descendant or posterity. So, um, it is saying our children may be seduced by this culture, but what we must be sure of is the, the further future that, um, that it's because it's specifically two generations later, the, the Moapuna will be able to taste our, our sweetness, which is both the sweetness of the culture and the sweetness of the coconut fruit itself and the coconut water within it. But if we look at Kawe La Wela Iloko, um, to break that down, ka is just, a, it's unusual in Hawaiian to have an article, like a, de, a, def, a definitive article, like the or a, like the or a. But here there is one, meaning that this is being so specific, attention is being drawn to the significance of this. So, um, the waiwa waila wa is completely another crazy set of uh, juxtapositions of coconut water, literally hanging water, sea riddle. Um, and then, so kawewe i loko, loko means has this, this one I, I want to, I'll show you because this one's um, kind of key. Um, so this is talking about the riddle of the, the hanging coconut water, which of course is a riddle because it's water 
that isn't descended to the ground and merged into the ocean. Um, but that uh, that coconut water is inside, within, interior, but it also means like the, the interplay of associations in this one word are, are so uh, epic. Um, in, within, interior. So the interior of the coconut would also be like the interior of the island or the interior of, of the North America, the mainland. Um, but also inside, internal organs as tripe entrails. Um, on or to the mainland. Um, where those, or where those in the house slept. So loco also means where, um, I have, uh, let's see. So these are just a bunch of sayings that involve the word loco. Um, but then it goes on to character, disposition, heart, feelings, pond, lake, pool. And then mainland of the United States, noted in a chant from 1860. Um, so the, the, the interiority, so there is a kind of Zen um, resolution of the paradox of the interior of the coconut is that which will bring it back to life. Um, while at the same time, it's the, the, the temptation of, of leaving Hawaii and going to the mainland is, is present too. So all of these things are being juggled in the air. Um, I don't know what, what do you think about that? Well, in general, the, the poem just, just gets more beautiful as, as we see these, uh, these definitions and these multiple meanings. Um, yeah. and, and in this, you know, um, uh, I'm sort of wondering, you know, it almost gets back to the, uh, I may be going too far afield here, but the Sapir Wharf, like, you know, those natives that that know North instinctively. Right. Whereas here, you know, inside versus outside has so much more meaning to them than, yeah. than it does to us. And it sort of can uh, um, apply to anything, uh, a living thing, uh, us, uh, nature, a tree, uh, the, the geography. There's uh, an inside uh, and an outside that they that they see in everything. Right. Yeah, I, I think that's. I think that's that's right. And that's that's pretty awesome, Michael. That's pretty. Yeah. It, it is. <laughs> Yeah. You know, thinking about, uh, I, I have uh, made a couple of uh, vacation type trips to uh, Hawaii. And, and one thing I remember is uh, in terms of direction, they talked about people wouldn't necessarily say you go north or south or left and right. 
they would say ocean versus mountain. Right. You know, those were uh, directions tied, you know, so meaningful on a, on a small island. Right. Uh, that, again, is not part of our experience. But these multiple meaning words, wow. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, to, I, I wish Pamela was still here because in, in a way, um, what I was saying there about like, in a way, at first the words make us feel kind of like outsiders or that we're not pronouncing them right. Or, um, but the words are also themselves the 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 kawea wea lea ropes thrown to the the reader that have the potential to lead us to these definite to the these the complexity of these definitions so yeah. so the the words both estrange, but also invite one to go and find out about the words, right? So it's kind of an invitation or maybe even a provocation. It's you know, Alice. You, yeah. We're, we're inviting you to, to look at our language and the depth of language you can learn something you think you know everything but uh, but you don't right and and so like and the paradox is that she's relying on our empire speech superior wharf internalized logic of not of of a certain kind of knowledge being the most important thing, um, like a certain kind of book learning being the most important thing. So it's a, it's a, it's a trick. It's a, it's a little trap door <laughs> that. Um, causes us who want to master the poem to go and look at the words, but the words force us, once we read the poem through again, understanding the meaning of the words, to question our own notions of our orientation in the world itself. So it's like, it's like a bait and switch. <laughs> I'm wondering if a native language speaker would hear these words in the poem and instinctively either grasp all that depth or know of which definition the poet is trying to use at that moment. Right. I'm it's a one it's a wondering i'm uh, not talking to somebody who actually is a native hawaiian who speaks the language i guess we would know for sure but right. I, I just I, I'm, I'm just thinking about that compared to us who we need to google every word and then we get five definitions for a word and we're we're taking a look at all of them and i think that's like you like you said it's a it, it's um it's a trap door in a way <laughs> yeah it might be in a sense like uh you know we as as poetry lovers we we find this complexity in english in our own language that we know and i imagine among hawaiians there are some who would want to read it literally and find the most prominent meaning meaning and and others who maybe like us would just love uh seeing the the different meanings in here the the depth of of the poem so it 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 just might be the uh 
you know, the, the poetry minded versus the, the literal minded. Right. And, and I would, my, my argument, my, my response to that to be, would be um, that uh, what that poem is a portrait of is the poetry minded. Yes. Oh, sure. Uh, but, you know, in, in a sense, uh, you know, so many poems we read have, have a, I don't know what to call it, a surface validity. You read it and you say, yeah, I, I get it. Right, and then right. you spend some time with it and it, it just opens up, it blossoms. We, we just look, I mean, we're still reading uh, Emily Dickinson <laughs> for 10 years now in Mod Po over and over and finding new meaning in, in the simplest uh, few words. Right, right. Right. And I guess, um, yeah, what, and what I, I would, um, in terms of the Sapir Whorf hypothesis, in terms of being literal minded versus um, poetry minded, part of the argument I was trying to make when we were talking about Rothenberg is that I, I, from all the study that I've done of it over the years, oral languages cannot be literate minded because they're not written they can't be um, fixed in place. They're not fixed in place. They're constantly in movement and shifting over, over time and over generations. And so I think that there's um, also, and I, and I think that the, the body's relationship to the voice in an oral language also roots the mind into the, the body, which is part of nature. There's never, there could never be a Descartes in, a, in an oral language. <laughs> I don't know. I would, uh, I wouldn't, I'd like to think there could be an, in a sense, I, I think I understand what you're saying, Jason, but I, I wouldn't want well, to what, rule out their possibility what, of. What Descartes does, what Descartes <laughs> does in his, in order to, to think, Descartes goes into the center, dark center of a house where there's a little stove and it's like totally dark and he can just be alone with his thoughts. He completely, his move in order to think is to completely cut himself off from the natural world. That's, that's the move that allows the rest of his thoughts to flow and and i think that like especially reading like dig nanook akpik and um and some of this work we're looking at something that we can't conceive these are cultures that didn't invent agriculture Right, so they never had to account for the, they never, I mean, in a way, like the earliest cuneiform is theorized to be accounting um, for trade 
in surplus grain. That never happened in Hawaii or in Alaska. You lived in rhythm with, you lived, the, you, you, the boundary between your own, there, there can't, the, the notion of selfhood in these pre-agricultural culture, or pre is it's not the right word, in these cultures that never went in the direction of, of surplus agriculture, um, I would say that the self has to be like the the Cartesian Inuit is the Inuit who is um, embedded in the landscape, not even, I mean, embedded even keeps the separation that they are, uh, that the body and the land are part of the same thing. Even time, even time seemed yeah. to be in that way. Even time folded back into the land, into the people. There was, right. there was very little distinction. Right. You know, this uh, brings up, uh, uh, I did read uh, Ceremony, the uh, not just the poem, but uh, the book oh, by Leslie Amarman Silko. Um, and uh, just thinking that at the time she was starting in some of uh, her early uh, education, she was involved with May May uh, Bersenbrugger. Mm -hmm. oh. And uh, yeah, they were friends, and I think they may have helped each other with their uh, work. But you know, hello the roses to uh, to May May. Uh, I swear she uh, she took some uh, you know hallucin hallucinogenic drugs to become a as much one uh, with nature. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> as uh, as we're talking about here, in in a sense, I don't want to say artificially, but you know, by by chemical means, being able possibly to uh, see, to be in the world or to exist in the way that uh, Opic, Opic uh, exists. Right. And fascinating. And I'm, I'm gonna have to go uh, now, yeah. but in, in terms of uh, just thinking on for maybe a different reason, but the Descartes in, in the sense of, uh, you know what he was doing as uh and, and just how it relates to this i think there, there's just so much to that i just got to <laughs> you know, probably spend quite a bit of time probably even sleeping on it yeah see. I, I understand 100 percent uh what you're getting at jason and i agree with it but mm -hmm. just in into in terms of the significance uh right. Uh, the inner exploration versus the outer exp exploration of the mind, of consciousness, and all. Just something very intriguing there. Yeah, and that, what you had said about the, the idea of the inside and the outside is, um, is, key, is, is, a, is key. How you conceptualize inside whether there is an inside and an outside <laughs> you know yes but, yeah even that's right you can keep uh just breaking down all these barriers that that we put up so easily and naturally right i mean and and you, if you think about the the kind of structures in which oral culture people lived in they are not architecture 
in the way that we understand architecture. They're not the skyscrapers of Honolulu. They are organic structures um, in which the difference between being inside and outside, you're always both inside and outside. Yes. Or as, as I think you were uh, getting at there, that that's a distinction we make that they may not, well, I guess they do in this, but even there, it's probably English speakers who are writing down those definitions. Right. And, and creating those, uh, those inside outside structures that may not exist to the people who are speaking that, uh, that language. Oh, it gets even deeper now, Michael. Oh, I know. This is, <laughs> <laughs> this is the sp I don't know if it's spiraling up or down. <laughs> but yeah, it's spiraling. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but I, I hope that, uh, the, the, I hope that we could take everything we were just talking about abstractly and just to the end, bring it back to the Whole Foods poem. Yeah. Man, and, if you take all those words and the level of depth that each one has and toss it into a Whole Foods. Right. That's... And the Whole Foods as a place you go into a Whole Foods. Right. To get your food. You don't go outside your building. It's 1315. Okay, coming. All right, so. Yeah. Um, I am, um, I am uh, gonna be available at uh, 6 p.m. tomorrow night. And, um, I want it and, and to kind of have a, because Dan Talala Papa um, is a poet of merriment. <laughs> his poems are fun and his art is fun. And he's not um, having these same kind of he's not at the same degree of crisis and um like me such a horror like me as i yeah. hear the roosters of samoa in the laughing of coyotes <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah so tomorrow i want to talk about his work okay jason Fantastic. thank you so much this uh, this was wonderful and you know, too bad we we just can't meet in person. Uh, but this will have to do. This will have to do. Yeah. And uh, Jason. Yes. Good to meet you and spend time with you. Absolutely, Michael. Same. Okay. Uh, Gudrun, are you still there? Yes, I'm still there. Have, have you have... have you been able to follow along? Yeah, I felt I had to run away for maybe seven minutes, but uh, I, I, uh, yeah, apart from that, I've been following all the time. I yeah. had to, it has I, enjoyed me a lot. I am um, very, very curious about your take on what we discussed especially because you are from an an island nation an island as well yes thank you for this i am of course of from a country that uh, <clears throat> uh, maybe by, built its identity on uh, on the oral uh, literature of the sagas and the medieval literature icelandic literature Right. So I found it interesting when you were talking about the oral tradition. I was reflecting on our our scientists from the, from the beginning of last century who were starting to discuss and uh, to analyze our literature. 
I have also been traveling around the world, actually. I, I, I've been on an eight-month journey uh, oh around the world. And on this journey, I, I was especially interested in, in Aboriginal culture and indigenous culture. And I was actually for a week in, in Hawaii. So <laughs> it was very meaningful now to, to read these poems, poems from Hawaii. Wow. And I found exciting uh, the brochure, the, the second poem, the brochure about the situation, of, about the language, and about yeah. the Creole and the pidgin language. Yeah. It's amazing. And I really, before, when you were talking about the language, the, about the, the poem, I really very much wanted to read the poem with my Icelandic accent. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, uh, yeah, well, that's, <clears throat> I've been to Iceland. It's my favorite place on the planet. Oh, wow. I spent, um, I went there for two weeks from the end of Christmas through New Year's Eve and uh, spent New Year's Eve on the beach at a, at a huge bonfire in front of Bjork's house. Wow. <laughs> where she came outside and gave everyone champagne and gathered in a circle around the bonfire with her friends and sang Icelandic songs. Wow. <laughs> Nice. That has been something very special. <laughs> yeah, but um, but I'm 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 because the Ic Icelandic language has been relatively stationary. Is would it be correct to say that it's been fairly stationary? Yes. Our our uh, scientists, uh, language scientists, talk with them very proudly about our language and called it the Latin of the North. That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. And I, I would, um, I would really ab ab appreciate it if, um, if you could write I mean maybe in the forum for for that this last poem that we just read or or something just a bit about um how how different I mean because there was I mean I, I, I would love to teach a class on Icelandic poetry because it raises entirely similar and different kinds of questions. Um, because, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious about your thoughts about the Icelandic language in relationship to these language, the language situations on these other islands. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, I somehow, I somehow don't relate to it. Uh, uh, this mixture of languages, because yeah, maybe it's it's to it's totally the opposite. You could say it yeah. has been very isolated. Uh, for centuries, right. But then we had the Danish influence. We were uh, governed by the Danes uh, right. a few centuries, and then the language was, uh, uh, yeah. Then Danish influenced the language, but somehow right. uh, the 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 population was held for itself, I think, somehow, and kept apart from this Danish governance. And yeah, that's interesting when you say it. Yeah, that's maybe yeah. some some relation in it yeah and and i wonder just about the the icelandic language as 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 a source of 
national pride and as a source of um, con I wonder what kind of um, uh, in the way that I was thinking about, like, I'd be curious for you to take a little time and think about some of the, maybe some of the, the differences from between Icelandic and English. I mean, because Icelandic is essentially old English, right? Wow. <laughs> well, it's. I think it has common roots. It's. It's. Yeah. It's, it's a German language. I think English is English on a, a German language. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, the, the old English is entirely uh, German Germanic. Yeah. But um, the thing is, is we could do this entire class about the island of Brit of uh, Britain. And, and the island of Ireland mm -hmm. and and simply the complex history of the English language and its its development basically as as a kind of accident of its proximate of its easy access of its easy proximity to mainland Europe and the constant waves of, of invasions of new languages. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, even in England, there are, is Gaelic and Welsh and, and Scots Gaelic, um, which are all experiencing a resurgence of of interest and education in the schools. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, but what 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 um, you? I I yeah, I'm just I'm just curious. I mean, you could just if you don't even want to make it public. You could just uh, write a kind of uh, meditation, just thinking out loud on paper or thinking out loud on mm -hmm. your computer about some of the ways in which the situation of Iceland and the Icelandic language can help shed not shed light because it it it's the opposite but the in the way it is so opposite it kind of brings into relief a lot of the situations elsewhere yes yes it's it's very interesting because yeah the first thing I thought when you were saying this now was uh, yesterday I was thinking about all this suffering that the people had to go through, uh, through the colonialism. Right. And I thought by us it was totally the opposite, but of course we had also a lot of suffering. Uh, right. So it's, yeah, it's interesting. And I think that the, uh, that just the Icelandic landscape and it's, um, I mean, I really think that there is a massive um, influential relation relationship between language or voice, which comes from the mouth, and the f the. the way in which we s stay alive mm. um, and 
the like like I wonder like in the way in which um, I mean it, it, what's so interesting about Iceland and is the the I think pivotal difference between Iceland and all these other places is that there was not an indigenous population that was uh, then like the because the Inuit if there had been an Inuit population on Iceland mm -hmm. I think things would be very different yeah definitely that's right and so it's a matter of geography and um, food I mean, it's really like the, the, the relationship of language to our relationship to the land, I think is, or, or to the sea, mm -hmm. is, is um, essential. Um, but I would, I would love some, some, Icelandic literature recommendations. Mm -hmm. Did you recommend something to me a, a few days ago? No, I didn't. Uh, I don't Did think so. Someone else recommended an Icelandic writer to me. Oh, sir. I don't remember. I'm going to have to go look through my emails. Yeah. Uh, are you meaning uh, poetry? You, it's mainly poetry. Or 13, 13. Interested in, I, think it's I think it was um, more kind of like lyric, experimental fiction. Or I'm not even sure if it would be easily identified within a particular genre. No. Um, maybe I just read about it. Oh. Um, but I'll, I'll look it up. Yeah, if you find it, maybe I can, it can bring me somewhere. Um, of course, it, the, the great barrier is the language. It's totally, I mean, I think the language is inaccessible for you. We have to, we'd have to have it somehow in, in translation. Right, we? right, yeah. right. There's um, a really fascinating poet, uh, a Swedish poet named, um, sh her name is Asa Berg. It's A-A-S-E-B-E-R-G. And um, there just happened to be a, uh, a poet fluent in Swedish who's been translating her work. Okay that is um, really amazing work, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, um, I, I really, um, how wonderful to have that as your home and then to be able to travel the world. Yes, thank you. Yes, and now I'm back home. I was when I when I when we started the course. I was in Chicago, and I I, I wanted <laughs> to stay there, but we were, made right. another decision now because right. of this situation. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yes, thank you, Jason. I'm so happy that I could uh, that I I'm so happy to participate in this course. I'll see if I find some uh, Icelandic literature in 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 English, okay. some Icelandic poetry. And I, I think I'll, I'll see what I will do with your challenge of uh, setting myself down and write. Okay. Yeah, you can- Thank you for that. Yeah, just, um, it could be just really uh, rough writing. You could send to me and we can just talk more um, or, you know, something that you can, uh, whatever you're comfortable with, whatever is best for you.
in learning more. Thank, yes, thank you for that. That's very kind. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll see what I, and if I have some obstacles, I, I, I'll just tell you. Okay. <laughs> I'll take the ball. <laughs> All right. Yeah, you're, you're always um, free to, um, you're free to call me or email me anytime because I need a friend in Iceland. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Oh, but I'm really <laughs> proud if I, <laughs> if I can have a role there. <laughs> thank you very much for that. Yes, I plan to go I, as soon as I can plan a trip in the future, that's where I'm going. So maybe after, maybe in a year or two, I'll, I'll see you there. Okay, fine. That would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and thank you for this course. I'll, I'll continue. It's it's really fun to, to follow this. Are, are you also going to take some, some Chinese or something like that? I think it's so... Yes. About, well, yeah. the thing is, is everything is taken... I thought we would move much faster through the material. Yes. But um, I I kept getting emails from people saying it was too much and to mm -hmm. slow down. So I have um, a whole week of uh, Asian American writing. Okay. So, um, but I'm, I'm on a strict deadline to finish on the fourth. Yes. So my plan is to spend next week on the, on maybe like five days on Caribbean poetry. Um, and then I want to switch to Asian American and Middle Eastern American poetry. Mm -hmm. and end with that. Yeah. Well, if whatever you have left over, you can uh, do for Ethnopo part two next season. Yeah, I, well, that's what I'm doing is everything that I'm, um, I, I just, when I started putting the class together, I became so obsessed um, and I've gathered so much material. Um, so I'm, going to over I don't know if you've looked but I've been building web pages that are resource pages for each topic um, and I'm gonna I don't know in a month or two have all of those completely built and interconnected so yeah, that, there, it's impressive the amount of material. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I want to synthesize it a bit more. And I actually figured out how to put forums on my website. So I could have a secret class too. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> yeah. Is, but, is this your specialization? Uh, the poetic my, I, my specialization, what is my, I don't have, in my 20s, I worked, until I was 31, I worked in publishing um, at Random House in New York. Okay. And uh, worked for the poetry editor and, uh, was a kind of rising star in the public New York publishing world. And then I decided to pursue my own poetry. So I left that. And so I have a book of poetry. And I spent probably about six or seven years just really focused on that. And then I went 
to the University of Pennsylvania um, PhD program in English. And it took me seven years to write my dissertation, which is about nature documentary and the history of uh, the, the, the kind of uh, all of the weird moments where uh, all the different ways in which um, people have so I, I was going to write a dissertation on science and nature poetry, but I changed at the last minute to do uh, uh, cinema and, and video. So my, my, my PhD is from a dissertation on um, the, the strangeness of nature documentary. And um, like I have a chapter about Jacques Cousteau's first film that he made um, with the French director Louis Malle. Um, and in that first movie, which won an Academy Award and won the Palme d'Or at, at Cannes, um, it's, it's incredibly violent. And they, they, they kill whales and they blow up coral reefs with explosives. And uh, so, so one chapter is trying to understand how Cousteau got from that film to becoming an environmentalist. That sounds absolutely mind-blowing. What, what is this film called? It's called The Silent World. Wow. I can't imagine. That, that sounds very un Jacques Cousteau like from my memory of Jacques Cousteau. Well, exactly. And my argument, my, my argument in the chapter is really that it was the process of making this movie that uh, turned, because um, before, certainly before World War II, um, there, there's enormous amounts of violence in nature films, of human on, on nature violence. And the, the kind of ethical imperative to look at nature as something beautiful and important to protect did not emerge until really 1960. It was present in Walt Disney nature documentaries for children in the 50s, but not otherwise. All the other, uh, but, but this Cousteau film is the first film in which the world saw whales swimming underwater. The world, people had never seen that before. Um, and I think that uh, it, it starts out as an exploration of World War II shipwrecks in the Mediterranean. And um, it's really amazing because you can see the divers 
cameras as they're going through these shipwrecks, like the camera will kind of jerk to the side to like look at a fish. Like that that's not what they were there to film, but it's what caught their, began to catch their attention. So, um, I don't know. It, it took, I, I'm still recovering from it because it literally <laughs> took me, I was in, at Penn as a grad student for 10 years. So I, wow. three, I had three years of classes and then seven years of writing this dissertation, um, which I wrote in the last three months of the seven years. <laughs> because I had to do so much research to figure out my ideas and to understand there was so much because it wasn't my field my field is poetry and literature so there was so much reading about um, media theory that I had to do um, and so much kind of research into representation, like pre-analog uh, recording representations of nature. So there was, I, I just went down, like I spent a whole year researching um, the deforestation of Europe and the adoption of it's 1345 i spent a year researching the uh, the adoption of coal as a fuel um which was never which was never used until there was no wood left and people were freezing to death in europe oh wow so essentially you basically had to get like seven many degrees over those years just to write yeah. your dissertation and and it's it's the luck of the english that they were the only place that had a huge reserve of coal right by the ocean right at the surface of the the terrain so New, the Newcastle on Tyne, like British became, the, Brit, the British became a superpower because they supplied continental Europe with coal. Wow. How about that? And it's by pure accident that they happened to have it available in a place that they could mine um, and ship easily. So, so I don't know. The world is crazy. I gotta go have a cigarette. <laughs> and, uh, we'll keep talking. <laughs> and Jason, uh, I'm I'm happy to hang out anytime. So when this is over, you know, I'm I'm around. Great, excellent, okay. and I'm in the Fine. city too. So yeah, um, so we can definitely do stuff in the in the city. Yeah, right on. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay. All right. Well, thank you, Godren. Nice uh, hanging with yes. you today. Yeah, pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Nice. Okay. okay. Nice to be. All right, with Jason. You. Thank you very much, nice. Jason. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. Bye, -bye. Oh. <laughs> bye everybody. Bye bye. Bye.
That was great.
It's 14 hours.
It's 14.15. You can unplug now. You can unplug now. You can unplug now.
You can unplug now. You can unplug now. You can unplug now. You can unplug now. You can unplug now.
You can unplug now. You can unplug now.